give a brief uh, global overview in 25 minutes of the sources of lead and how things stand around the world. It's not as if it's not, un not unambitious. And issues for wildlife, people, and the environment, and efforts to reduce exposures and lessons, and what works and what doesn't work. I shall certainly learn a lot being with you here today over the last 20, 24 hours, having flown over the entire African continent. I know how big it is, and I can just guess how complex the issues are compared with tiny old UK. Um, just to mention, because um, we don't know each other, forgive this, I've been involved in hunting and wildlife conservation um, all my um, working life, both domestically and internationally, um, and among them, lead-related issues for, for over 45 years now. Things don't move fast. I was chief executive of the British Association for Shooting and Conservation for 25 years and a senior vice president of the Federation of European Hunting Associations um, for many of them. And although supposedly retired, um, I continue as chair of the United Kingdom's uh, Lead Ammunition Working Group, founded in 2010 by government and now continuing as an expert um, group dealing with the science and evidence um, connected with lead-based and alternative ammunition, which is a huge subject. Now, my um, eyes, in my eyes, there are two ways that we can um, look at this problem. The first one is uh, the complicated one, that lead poisoning of wildlife and people is multifaceted and multidisciplinary, described by a huge volume of sophisticated scientific literature from many countries, which to the uninitiated can appear very confusing. And the second is a very simple one. Lead is simply a nasty poison and has been recognized as such for hundreds of years. It did quite a lot of damage to the Romans. Uh, and the issue now is how best to reduce or prevent exposures to it wherever possible. And the learned academic gentleman I was sitting next to on the airplane last night was giving me a long lecture on the pollution of the Vaal River and various contaminants of, uh, of uh, water supply infrastructure in South Africa. Now, um, the science. Let's get the science out of the way first. Um, the position on the science is um, that it's settled. The, but the evidence base is expanding all the time, not just about the generally accepted problems for wildlife and human health, but also in all sorts of other um, ish ways. Um, for example, for those who go hunting, there is an association between simply the act of going hunting and elevated blood lead levels, um, home loading, lead inhalation of lead fume in, uh, in shooting ranges, and so on. Uh, and even in Scandinavia, work on uh, the dangers of feeding lead uh, of game meat off cuts to your hunting dogs, which are very valuable to you. So wherever we're looking, wherever science is looking, it's finding a range of new problems. Looking at gener lead generally, there have been a number of big reviews, and since this is a wildlife conference, uh, a conservation symposium, um, the Convention on Migratory Species Ecological Review, I can give you the precise references to all these in the text if you want, if you want that afterwards, um, which identifies a variety of key industrial sources, about which we'll hear more, which are now mostly controlled by law regulation and commercial good practice. Although in South Africa you're finding infrastructure problems and in Canada too they've got infrastructure water supply problems in America too um, because the infrastructure's been there for a long time. 
So um, I refer in particular, for those of you who are particularly interested in a, a, a special issue of the journal Ambio, um, which is a journal of the human environment, uh, published this September in cooperation with the Swedish um, Royal Acad Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, they do Nobel Prizes and that sort of thing. Um, and it covers um, many issues, but underlines that lead poisoning is now being reported in more and more wildlife species and places, and unexpected places as well. And as far as ammunition is and fishing weights are concerned, explains the improved performance and utility of effective alternatives and substitutes, which are now much more effective than they were um, some years ago. Um, so let's start by looking at the institutions, the institutional orchestra of high-level um, organizations. The World Health Organization um, is emphatic and it points out that lead is a cumulative toxicant that affects multiple body systems and is particularly harmful to young children. And in the body, it's distributed in the blood to the brain, liver, kidney, and bones. And when it gets into the bone, it then gets released back into the blood during pregnancy and during lactation and becomes a source of exposure to the developing fetus, fetus and the newborn. Press the wrong button. There is no known um, safe level of lead exposure, unlike many other contaminants. If you have a little bit, it does you a little bit of harm. And lead exposure is preventable. So how big is this problem? We're talking about lead as a whole. As far as the Institute of Health and Metrics and Evaluation, which is used by the World Health Organization, they estimated in 2016 that lead exposure accounted for 540,000 deaths, the highest burdens in low and middle income countries, because infrastructure investment and so on is, 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 is probably weakest there, and enforcement. 63.8% uh, of the global burden of developmental intellectual disability, you can ignore the word idiopathic, I'll explain it later, 3% um, of the global burden of heart disease, and 3.1% of the global burden of stroke. That's not small fish. So looking at it from the environmental point of view, the United Nations Environment Program, they, um, uh, derive from, they derive their approach from the um, aspirations for a pollution-free planet and the Pollution and Health Sustainable Development Goals, a very high-level policy setting. And in 2017, the United Nations Environment Assembly in Nairobi recognized the need to address lead ammunition specifically as one aspect of the problem and adopted a resolution acknowledging the problems caused by lead ammunition and the need for action. Now, ammunition lead is exceptional. And forgive me for stating the obvious. Um, it's ex exceptional compared to the much larger scale uses of lead in industry and commerce simply because it's discharged into the environment as ammunition and projectiles and fragments after it's struck a target is unregulated and mostly irrecoverable, where it builds a toxic legacy. So the, um, it all started uh, with the African-Eurasian Migratory Waterbird Agreement with lead shot and waterfowl. And although it remains important, things have moved on since then. Uh, first addressed legislatively um, in North America in 1991, this is, was central to the negotiation of the African-Eurasian Migratory Waterbed Agreement in the early 1990s. Um, and 
in 95, this treaty called on the parties to endeavor to phase out the use of lead shot for hunting in wetlands by the year 2000, as if. That date has turned out in hindsight to be optimistic, um, and a recent update is that the AEWA strategic plan for 2019 to 2027 includes the action that parties of which South Africa is one that have not already done so to phase out the use of lead shot in wetlands in accordance with AEWA action plan and more detailed actions are identified in the revised action plan for Africa. And then things grew from there with the Convention on Migratory Species it, um, because the, the, this included um, the threats generally to human and wild, uh, generally and wild, human health risks um, f following the Peregrine Fund conference in 2008. That was an American conference, and some of you here may have been there, I don't know. Um, the Convention on Migratory Species reflected this and expanded uh, the AEWA ambition by calling on parties to phase out the use of lead ammunition across all habitats, wetland and terrestrial. And this reflected um, CMS's um, wider taxonomic scope, the need to eliminate um, poisoning of large raptors rising from the use of lead bullets, and acknowledging that lead ammunition poses a risk um, to, um, um, to um, uh, a risk to um, both wetland and terrestrial habitats. And to this end, the CMS has established a number of groups and initiatives with interests in lead and ammunition. The Multi-Species Vulture Action Plan, which I know um, your people are involved with. The CMS Preventing Poisoning Working Group, again, and within that, a lead task group, which has been established but hasn't done much so far because of funding constraints. And in passing, I just mention also the Convention on Biodiversity, Biological Diversity, because the CBD adopted the, what was technically known as the Addis Ababa principles and guidelines for sustainable use of biodiversity, which provided a high level framework for no use of the components of wildlife must lead to the decline of biodiversity and a need to minimize adverse environmental uh, impacts. And whilst I'm just finishing off on the, um, the, the, these institutions, of course the International Olympic Committee has shooting events and they conti the continued use of lead shot for Olympic skeet and trap disciplines, despite the Olympic Charter on Environmental Concern recognition of CBD and partnerships with UNEP um, is going absolutely nowhere. Um, and I think that that is starting to attract um, attention because the target shooters have to own this problem as well. So where have we got to so far? The WHO, the United Nations agencies, and numerous treaty bodies all emphasize the need and the scale of the health and environmental problems caused by lead. These agencies and national ones too are emphasizing the importance of reducing all exposures, um, including the last great unregulated ones, um, not least of which is ammunition and fishing weights. Let's now turn to the workers and look at the main biogeographic uh, regions in very simple outline and find out what's happening. Now, um, as far as southern, I start in southern Africa, um, you understand much better than I do, a stranger like me possibly can, that South Africa is such a big country with a unique set of issues. But I know by reputation that this is um, where greatest attention has been paid to lead outside North America and Europe with lively strands of engagement um, with energetic wildlife NGOs, academics, and also hunting communities. Um, and the highlights, though risks will inevitably, inevitably um, run much wider, um, 
are what you have been discussing probably in the last couple of days, are focused on vultures. Um, and we've heard recently about the setting up of vulture safe zones, and I understand that real progress has been made in cooperation with hunters and large, of large game in some areas. Um, and I have had my attention drawn to the declines in the Nile crocodile, their exposure to lead after intake of lead fishing weights during gastrolith ingestion, and that's being associated with consequences for their um, egg development and hatchling health. And I include these rather obvious statements in front of this audience without um, um, batting an eyelid because this paper is being read by a lot of people who don't know anything about Southern Africa. So um, it's included in there. So let's go skip up to uh, across the ocean uh, to, um, to North America and Canada. As already mentioned, non-toxic Shot has been required for hunting all species of waterfowl nationwide since 1991. And in January 2017, the US Fish and Wildlife Service issued an order to phase out lead-based ammunition on all 568 million acres of agency-managed land and waters, that's all lead-based ammunition. And it, with his inimitable style, Donald Trump in March um, immediately issued a counter order um, overturning it to expand access for outdoor enthusiasts and also make sure the community's voice um, is heard. I wasn't quite sure what the community was whose voice was being heard, but I think it was probably something quite close to his constituency. Only California has so far um, implemented complete non-toxic laws starting in 2019 for hunting all state regulated game species, whether on public or private lands. Um, and that's a, a laboratory for um, new developmental research. Up in Canada, non-toxic, similar to America, is only required for the hunting of migratory birds that fall under the federal authority. Um, upland species and all big game mammals fall under provincial jurisdiction, so the use of lead shot and lead rifle bullets is still allowed. But um, the lead is actually listed in the um, in Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which provides for the federal government to, um, uh, to uh, introduce stronger measures where appropriate, uh, and the Canadian uh, Governmental Ministry Environment Canada is currently conducting a conversation to encourage more use of lead-free shotgun and rifle ammunition and we're expecting the results of that um, any time now. But the recent narrow squeak win for Mr. Uh, Trudeau may have um, um, just put that on hold for a while. And I should also mention the evidence of lead exposure in Ar Arctic subsistence hunters um, as well. Now in South America, South America is really interesting because uh, looking to South, um, there's been um, a paper published quite recently in July this year which has described the lead levels and the isotopic fingerprints of 315 free-ranging animals belonging to 18 wild game species in four remote areas of the Peruvian Amazon which provided a comprehensive picture of anthropogenic lead pollution in tropical rainforests. And here you see you've got other exposures because it, they concluded that hunting ammunition is probably the main source of lead in wildlife, even in these remote, very remote places, um, with oil-related pollution as a major source of contaminant lead where oil is extracted. And so you can see these other factors coming into play. There are 39 papers, a literature search by um, Pablo Plaza um, this year from Argentina found 39 scientific papers um, on this topic involving 68 bird species. Most came from Argentina and Brazil, but also from Chile, Venezuela, Colombia, um, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Peru probably reflecting, the numbers actually probably reflecting the amount of research that's been done rather than any particular biological um, 
distribution. Where do we go to next? Well, I suppose we'd better go to Europe at some stage. Um, it wasn't until 2004 that the European Commission, uh, with the agreement of member states and the hunters' representatives, um, announced its aim to phase out the use of lead shot in wetlands as soon as possible and ultimately by 2009. And that was because they were actually parties in their own right to the Africa-Eurasia Waterbird Agreement. So they had to do something. But in 2016, um, the European Chemicals Agency, following the failure of most member states to introduce demonstrably effective regulations for wetlands, um, the European Commission asked the European Chemicals Agency, which goes under the name of ECHA, to produce a formal restriction proposal, um, the effect of which would be to require all member states to act consistently banning the use of lead shot over wetlands, rather than the Italians doing one thing and the Germans doing another and so on. So in the light of that, the evidence um, of that, um, the restriction process was extended in 2018, mandating the chemicals agency, ECHA, to produce a wider restriction proposal to protect the health of humans and wildlife in all habitats. And that process is underway. I mean, it involves, it, it avoids all the problems of a, a narrow wetlands only type restriction. And now um, there's another strand which I think is appropriate that you should, it would be helpful for you to be aware of. This is the registration um, and evaluation and authorization and restriction of hazardous chemicals. Um, this is a formal process. Um, and it was established last year that lead um, is to be identified as what's known as a substance of very high concern, um, SVHC, on account of its reprotoxicity, um, possible um, uh, can carcinogenicity, and, and so on, and its uh, long-lasting cumulative impacts in environments. That's why those are the criteria for making it as an SVHC. Um, um, and um, if that, um, if lead actually makes it onto the authorization list, which is the next level, it will almost certainly inevitably result in regulatory move uh, to ban non-lead ammunition as a whole, because you can't use a, an authorized substance in products going onto the market if there are alternatives. Can't do it. Um, so that is a fairly fundamental. It'll take time, but that process is underway, and I mentioned it for completeness. And then, on. just to mention the European Food Safety Authority, they had um, looked at dietary lead exposures um, back in 2010, um, identifying, and what they found was that there were close to health threshold lead levels for the general public resulting from their normal diet. Ignore lead, um, but just from their normal diet, they were, their, their blood lead levels and their tissue lead levels were at, at close to health threshold lead levels. And the additional risks to consumers of game, because it tends to have rather a lot of lead in it, especially for women of pregnancy age, children, and high level game consumers, sort of like eating game once a week or certainly m more than once a month, um, certainly if you're eating it more than once a week. It gives some scale to that. And then that has filtered down to member state level. And following the Food Safety um, Authority, a number of European countries have, issue, have issued public health warning advice um, to uh, game meat consumers um, including Norway, Sweden, Germany, Spain, France, Italy, and the UK so far. And in the UK, <coughs> I'm now very much aware, and quite closely involved in it, and how high street supermarkets are now labeling game meat products with lead warnings on, or committing themselves for consumer safety reasons to requiring all wild shot game and venison to have been not been shot with lead ammunition. 
Even the House of Lords doesn't allow game shot with lead ammunition to be served in the Palace of Westminster, but Sainsbury's, Tesco's, um, Harrods, and all the big stores are now committed to being lead free um, by 2021, and certainly the intention is that it should go wider than that by 21, 22. So Denmark and the Netherlands are notable for having successfully banned the use of lead shot for all hunting, and they've done it successfully. The hunters wouldn't go back. These countries are hugely valuable laboratories for R&D and demonstrating how lead is replaceable. I've been there two or three times and fired a lot of ammunition, um, and I can tell you it works. Now let's look at Japan. They introduced a partial ban on lead ammunition for deer in 2000. That seeker deer in Hokkaido, that's why it's partial, um, to protect their visiting eagles. And the studies of the white-tailed and Stella's eagles in Hokkaido more recently have revealed a, an interesting lesson that dead birds collected some time after a ban um, st still had elevated li liver lead c concentrations clearly associated with poisoning and illegal use of lead bullets after all that time. These sort of unenforced partial measures do not do deliver the job. Um, I just mentioned isotope analysis was consistent with lead ammunition. This was not environmental background lead ammunition. So um, Australia operates at state level, and Western Australia, has, they, the, the different states do different things. Some ban waterfowl, some ban hunting altogether, and they ban uh, the use of lead shot for duck hunting. But, more, hang on, yeah, I see what you did. Um, that what, they do, what the Australians are now realizing is that they shoot um, a vast amount of wild and feral animals in their considerable hinterlands. And this, there was an article, um, a very learned article, with a, with a colorful title, um, Heads in the Sand, Public Health and Ecological Risks of Lead-Based Bullets for Wildlife Shooting in Australia, basically saying there needs to be research done on what impacts that is having on their disposal of game. And New Zealand, um, I didn't want to leave them out either, um, um, <laughs> banned most lead shot use in 2006, but some sources of dietary lead exposure are not immediately apparent. They export a lot of lead, uh, lo a lot of um, game rather, I beg your pardon, they probably do the latter as well, uh, such as that of, of export, exported um, wild game. So let's look at some solutions. Um, in my mind, the, um, all, the, all this, the science and the regional experiences, which I've just skimmed over very, very briefly, tell us that wildlife and health would be substantially better served if we hunters and fishermen uh, did not use lead ammunition and lead weights. And the evidence also shows us, because I'm very much evidence-driven, that um, wildlife and health, of course, um, how we might go about that. They face innumerable challenges, and lead is, of course, just one of them, but it's one of the, that the evidence shows we can fix. And I just say this because it's important to get one's head around it, that rolling back traditions, I understand very much, having worked in this field, is indeed difficult and challenging. But if we care about wildlife and health, it needs to be done. So let's unpack it a bit. And some of the lessons which have come to me after, after 45 years. Change will only happen effectively when hunters and anglers really must change and their leaders buy into it and give the leadership. Voluntary and unpoliced measures, which you can applaud, will not ultimately serve the bigger picture. That's because you're leaving too many risks uncovered and there are too many loopholes um, for um, poor implementation. We're discovering also all the time, and I'm monitoring this on a day-to-day -day basis, ever more unexpected areas of exposure and risk. And the only way to deal with it, ultimately, is to prohibit sale and use. 
And the, the final point is that this will not harm hunting, rather the reverse. Now there's another, um, dun -dun -dun -dun. there's another thing that I'd like to unpack a bit is the commercial dimension because it's all very well talking about what hunters and the hunting community has got to do or should be doing, but ammunition and manufacturers and local ammunition retail outlets, that's your shop down the road, can and only and will only supply the necessary variety of alternatives for hunters to, to use and practice with and get to know and be confident about um, if it's profitable for them to do so. It might seem blindingly obvious to say that, but it's true. And the manufacturers themselves for producing these products must also be confident of sufficient demand to invest in production, upscaling, and distribution. And retailers must have sufficient customers to carry stocks on their shelves they know they can ship. They will not order 10,000 shotgun shells if it's just going to stay on their shelf. They just won't do it. Or they might do it once. So those are the, some, some of the very basic lessons uh, that struck me as important, which I share with you. Now, the direction of travel is clear. There's going to be more evidence on poisoning and risks from medical, veterinary, and environmental communities. There's going to be more acceptance of the problem and the need for solutions as the pennies drop in various quarters, wherever it is. There's going to be more research and development of alternatives that will improve and diversify non-lead ammunition. There's going to be more shared experience that will normalize their acceptance and use. It's not really so bad as you, you have been told that it might be. And if we can get there in the end, and I say this as somebody who's been worked in this field, there will be more secure and sustainable hunting, which has a value. There will be more jobs and economy securely based on ethically practiced hunting and tourism taking away an issue that anti-hunters can rail against. Game meat products and markets, however they're distributed to their consumers, will be strengthened by being lead free. And raptor and vulture conservation will be improved, perhaps the most important thing for a lot of people here and there will be more ecologically resilient landscapes and wildlife, and South Africa continuing its imaginative leadership um, in this field, as I know is happening. So thank you for listening, and my thanks to all of those who've helped me put this together, and for Franny Dutois for getting me here on time, wherever you are. Thank you very much. <laughs>